Welcome back to another episode where author and trial lawyer Rick Friedman shares his insights and techniques to having success in the courtroom. This video is episode three of six, which means if you haven't seen the previous episodes, we got to catch you up to speed. So I'll provide links in the description down below. So be sure to check those out. Speaking of which, whenever you do go down in the description, you'll also see links to Rick's books and other resources that are mentioned during this six episode series. Now I want to ask you to do one simple thing. If you find yourself liking this video, then please hit the like button down below. Doing so allows the video to rank higher, reach more people, and ultimately help more people. And that's always the goal. With all that out of the way, let's get back into the interview with Rick Friedman. I hope you enjoy. No, I think one of the very one of the very important skills for a trial lawyer to have is the ability to put themselves in the shoes of somebody else. So, you know. If I think about a juror listening to a presentation for somebody who was in a rear end collision and lost three months of work and, you know, still has some nagging neck pain, but it's mostly gone away. If the lawyer is trying to tell me that's the worst thing since the Holocaust, yeah. you know, I, I'm not going to, I'm not. Uh, so uh, I think lawyers, Plaintiff lawyers lose more cases and more arguments by overstating their case than by understating their case. Interesting. I, I think, um, you know, again, we give a heightened importance to our. Now, you can fr you can frame an issue in a way it causes. So, I mean, let's take a small, uh, I don't know. Have you read Polarizing? I can't remember if you. I, I have it. It's it's right there. I haven't read it yet. All right. Well, that's, I mean, that answers a lot of these questions. So, yeah. so think of it this way. We, we have a case of someone who uh, hit rear end collision Mm -hmm. uh, they're stopped at a stoplight. Somebody slams into the back of them. They didn't see them. Uh, if the and there, it's admitted liability, yeah. So where do you get your energy in a case like that? Why? Exactly. Why? How are we going to get any? Well, it's not going to come from your sparkling personality. It's not going to come <laughs> from your uh, charm and your. It just isn't. Mm -hmm. uh, so. That's a hard one to swallow, but for a lot of people. But once you swallow that, then the question is, okay, so what is this case about really? That gets mm -hmm. you back into the philosophy thing. You know, mm -hmm. we're saying this poor 52-year-old maintenance manager of a large office building is uh, you know, injured and his the quality of his life has been hurt. Mm -hmm. uh, he can't take his kid fishing on Saturdays like he used to and so on. Um, the defense is saying no big deal. You can still fish or you don't need to fish. There's no economic value in fishing. Yeah. Uh, you know, he says, I can't sleep at night. The defense says, well, you still are working. You haven't lost your job. You haven't lost anything. So you've got, you know, that was one of my big, for me, big insights of, you know, all of these trials are a clash of values. Mm -hmm. We're advocating a certain set of values. They're advocating a certain set of values. It's below the surface most of the time. Yeah. And it's, or if it's not below the surface, it's, it's handled in a clumsy way. But really, so in our, the example I just gave, uh, if they are implying that your client is a liar and a cheat mm -hmm. and is exaggerating his injuries, they've given you, they've handed you this gift of you've taken a routine, nothing ish kind of case and they're calling your client a liar. And now if the case is about them, you know, she ran the red light, there's no, or she, you know, slammed into the back of the client. There's no defense. They've admitted liability. We're here because they think, you know, this all white jury is not going to give money to a black woman. Mm -hmm. We're here because they think uh, they can accuse her of being a liar and a cheat. 
mm-hmm. and you'll turn her away. And you should turn her away if she's a liar and a cheat. So we've changed. So ultimately, it's to me, it's not story per se. Yeah. But what is this case about? What what decision do the jurors have to make? And what are the values that are implicated by that decision? So it sounds like that determination is de- developing, at least from the date of intake, right? Because it sounds mm-hmm. like as yeah. as they as you start getting more information of why the offers aren't going up, you start kind of getting the sense of, oh, mm-hmm. they're they're critiquing either the treatment plan, they're critiquing the extent of the injuries and things like that. So you're you're coming up with this not on the fly, but as things are developing. Well, I mean, again, it depends on the case. The case yeah. uh, you know, uh, it, right in the early days, you may just have somebody in a neck collar showing up at your office saying yeah. I was in an accident three months ago and it still hurts. And mm-hmm. I mean, that's all I know at that point. I don't know mm-hmm. anything else. As time goes on, you know, they hire an IME doctor who says, he, you know, we don't control all, all of the things that happen in the development yeah. of this universe of facts. Yeah. If they hire an IME whore who mm-hmm. says everybody's a liar and a cheat, the case starts to go in one direction. If they hire an IME person who's relatively straight and says, yeah, this person is injured and they may have this neck pain for the rest of their lives, but it shouldn't interfere with their function. We have a different type of case. And so uh, we are, we are, we are co-creating this yeah. presentation with the defense, whether we want to or not. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I had a case involving a motorcyclist and initially the insurance company is like, we're not accepting liability because he's a motorcyclist. He was speeding yeah. um, and we yeah. can hire an expert to prove that. And then by the end of it, it was, Okay, even though he got a rod put in his leg and a plate put in his hip, he doesn't have lifetime injuries or, you know, and and so it was a complete opposite of, okay, how are we going to handle this? How are we going to respond to this? Well, a lot of times it's like whack-a-mole. You knock down one defense and another one pops up or one defense theory or line of attack and then another one pops up. So, yeah, it's it's. you know, the ultimate, like, take your case with the motorcyclist. Uh, I don't know, was it was a, another driver responsible for the accident? Yeah. So the other driver in that situation, I'll try and give you the short version of it, did an illegal left-hand turn at an intersection with no light. In the state of Texas, at least, it's illegal to turn into a left turn only lane and trying to use it as a chance to, like, speed up in order to get with the flow of traffic. Right. right. So she did. she did that. And the defendant then changed lanes into my client's lane without using a blinker as well. And, but still it was, my client was speeding because he was 26 and on a motorcycle at that point in time. And it was a loud motorcycle. Yeah. Yeah. So, right. I mean, uh, that case can go in a whole lot of different directions just with that simple fact pattern and a lot of, so I don't, tend in a case like that to form a strong opinion about how it's going to be presented at trial because like i said so much depends on what position the defense takes are they admitting liability or are they fighting liability are they admitting the medical expenses are reasonable or are they fighting them so mm-hmm. a lot go in so getting wedded to i just read something really interesting the other day that said um uh if you if you your your own beliefs ideas and attitudes always have the potential to get in the way of you seeing the truth yeah and so if you form an impression of what the case is about on day 1 it can take you in the wrong direction and uh so it, part of it is staying open and being flexible i think so i'm going to own up to probably my biggest fault as a lawyer, at least what I struggle with the most. And I was reading the uh, the Elements of Trial book, and it talks about how the best directors can remove a good scene in order to make the, the movie even better. And there are times during, and this motorcyclist case is, is what you know rings a bell here, there are times mm-hmm. as the case is developing where I'm like, yeah, this defense is 
not handling this in a, in a very proper way. There are a lot mm -hmm. of things that they shouldn't be doing. There are a lot of answers in the discovery responses that are just deceptive and, and a lot of red yeah. flags. And so I'm like, man, if the jury saw or heard all of this and also all the bad things that the de defendant did, that'd be great. But at the same time, internally, I'm like, it's also going to get really into the weeds about yes. every little thing. So how do, how do you cut of like, let's just talk about this. And even though this is beneficial, how do you decide to take that out? Well, I'm not even sure it's beneficial. You know, okay. a lot of the things lawyers get all upset about are not that important or motivating to jurors. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I would, I, you know, I think a lot of plaintiff lawyers could benefit from a little tattoo on their forehead saying, leave your outrage at the door. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, there was a lawyer in Alaska, in my early years, a defense lawyer, who would just be the most obnoxious, difficult, dishonest person all through the litigation, mm -hmm. really aggressive and nasty personality. And then he'd get in trial and he'd be meek and mild as anything. Mm -hmm. But the plaintiff lawyer by then is just chomping at the bit. He can't wait to tell the jury, you know, so the plaintiff lawyer shows up angry, frustrated, in attack mode. I'm finally going to get this son of a bitch. And the jurors are looking like, what's wrong with you? This guy's so nice. He's so mild mannered. And, yeah. you know, so the stuff, the difficulty we have and now, of course, if you catch a witness lying, you know, great fact, or yeah. if you, but all the games they play, I'd say 95% of the time, the games they play, the unfair cheap shots they take in litigation before the trial starts, no matter how outrageous they are, I don't think it makes much of an impression on the jurors at all. They could care less. It's, you know, if if the trial is a pissing contest between two lawyers, the plaintiff lawyer always loses. At this point, let's maybe get to a little bit of the biggest concern the law venture audience has, which is objections. Hands down, people are afraid that they're going to go to trial or they're going to work up a case not knowing objections, not being able to tell the version of events they want to be able to tell. Maybe they have a witness with some great information, but they're afraid that an objection is going to be raised and they don't know how to either handle it or it won't come in. I mean, I've gone through two, three, five-week trials without making a single objection. 